All right, everybody, welcome to the Daily Space Weather. It's smash timber. Let's make it a smash timber to remember with some more awesome footage. Here's some composite imagery from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, ionized helium and iron. Sunspot 2860 in its setting mode produce a C-class flare while we did our show prep. Shout out to the sun once again. If you've got comments directly for the sun, leave them in our comments section. We've determined that if the sun is watching anybody's videos on YouTube, it's probably ours. Also, a new sunspot has just recently formed right up here. I don't remember which number is next on the list. Let's take a look at some more imagery. Also starting out smash timber properly with a coronal mass ejection. We'll show you the telemetry on that. Here's 193 angstroms and a well-defined south pole oriented coronal hole there is the main feature you can see in this wavelength. That dark feature there is what we call a coronal hole, an area that features an outgassing of probably intercalate layers, but in any case, an output of high speed solar protons. Hydrogen nuclei are coming out of there. And uh, if it remains intact, we may see some arriving at Earth's geospace. We'll show you a close-up of it in a minute. First, the colorized magnetogram. And again, new sunspot has just formed up here. It looks like it's going to be beta class. It's going to break out of the scene in beta class mode. So the likelihood of large solar flares is still certainly present, especially with sunspot 2860 having not set yet over the southwestern limb. Next, let's take a look at Lagrange point 5 and Lagrange point 1, the location of the Stereo A and Lasco C3 instruments, respectively. And here's the coronal mass ejection kicking off smash timber the right way with some solar activity. And it's a prime example of how from Lagrange point 5, out here where Stereo A is located, which is the frame on the left, it may look like a coronal mass ejection is headed toward Earth, as from that perspective, Earth is indeed off to your right. However, viewing it here from the Lasco C3 coronagraph, we can see no ejecta coming out of the left side of the disk or the top or bottom. It's all coming out of the right side of the disk, indicating the likelihood of a miss to the west. Here's the North Polar region. Great view of the North Solar Polar coronal hole in 193 angstroms. And here's this large, well-defined coronal hole rotating into the Earth-facing zone here. More imagery from the SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. The 10.7 centimeter radio flux has dropped all the way down to 84, and that's mainly because of the setting of sunspot 2860. Again, there's a new active region rising. Here's the one-year chart to put that in context. The black line here is the 10.7 centimeter radio flux. The lower corona, the sun's atmosphere, and the upper chromosphere, the mid-layer of the, of the sun's surface, puts out radio signal, and it's proportional to sunspot number. As you can see from this chart, the red line is the sunspot number. And NOAA is forecasting additional geomagnetic unrest and geomagnetic storm conditions throughout the day today. NOAA is forecasting KP4, KP5, and KP6 starting the day tomorrow as well as geomagnetic unrest on the 3rd as well. So lots of geomagnetic activity forecast here because of maybe miscalculation of coronal mass ejection trajectories. I don't know. But anyway, here is the Enlil spiral. There was a small coronal mass ejection strike yesterday. Again, that second CME there, I don't know how they're getting a geomagnetic storm out of that. I don't even think it's going to strike the geospace, but hey, that's what science is, right? Science, folks, is not a consensus. So if science were a consensus, we may still think the Earth is flat. Science is not a consensus. Science never was a consensus. Because when the empirical facts change, 
people's ideas need to change as well. Don't be ossified on your beliefs, folks. Let's look at seismicity real quick here. Here's the 90-day bar graph for global earthquake activity. And we saw some, some significant activity here in Oceania here, north of New Zealand and east of Australia. An interesting quake happened here. It's like a double quake. We saw a 5.2 at 250 kilometers estimated depth. And then 30 seconds later, another 5.2 at 557 kilometers estimated depth. So that's interesting. Two very deep quakes occurring in succession. Also a deep quake in Indonesia here, a 4.2 at 343 kilometers depth. Turkey also saw a 5.1. South Sandwich Island still rocking with a 5.6. So some new activity here in Oceania, continued activity in the South Sandwich Islands region. Here's a deep quake at Peru. It's only a 4.3, but at 100, 160 kilometers estimated depth. Vanuatu saw a deep quake at 4.4 magnitude, 231 kilometers estimated depth. Indonesia saw a 4.5 at just over 100 kilometers, and let's move on to volcanoes. It looks like a downtick in volcanoes. Kind of makes me want to sound the earthquake warnings, <clears throat> but I'm not really a seismicity expert. We're largely just reporting here. Suinose Jima, though, certainly exploding there in the Ryukyu Islands. Flight level 080. It's produced an 8,000-foot plume of volcanic ash. Nevado del Ruiz exploding, it looks like. At least gash gas plumes containing gas plumes containing some amount of ash reached 19,000 feet Saban Kaya explosively erupting producing a 24,000 foot ash plume over Peru please don't pull vault the caldera please do visit our links make it a smash timber to omash member smashomash.com contains lots of links to support the channel goes magnetometer here over the past three days looking fairly smooth and we've now got two instruments for you who haven't viewed in who haven't tuned into the videos for a while here we've got the go 16 and 17 now and check it out we have a divergence happening right here right as we did the show prep today we see a divergence you can see the goes 16 showing lower readings here around midnight and the goes the goes 16 showing higher readings around midnight rather that's the red and the goes 17 here showing lower readings around midnight that's midnight local time for the satellite. This is noon local time for the satellite. That's the GOES-16, the red letters. Anyway, getting into some pretty low readings here and a disparity, perhaps some magnetic turbulence being picked up by the GOES magnetometers. Let's look at the uh, heliospheric current sheet, magnetic polarity environment. It's the top view ecliptic plane field plot, and I would expect Earth to remain in a south pole current sheet here for an extended period. Again, there is a sunspot rising in the northeast, and that is related. Keep in mind this data is one, hours, is one hour old when we made the video and could change rapidly. Here's a line of sight data for the same thing. And we're expecting this blue line to stay north of the equator, which will likely keep Earth in a south pole current sheet. Here's the coronal hole plot showing you the sun's B field in blue. And the B field is the field that goes through a magnet, folks, in magnetohydrodynamics. The blue lines there showing the sun's B field. And you can see that red colored coronal hole there. That's south pole polarity, south solar polar field polarity, and not transequatorial. So really, this is still sort of a sputtering of cycle 25 as it's taking a long, long time to continue with the undergoing of the solar polar field reversal cycles. By the way, we've got a science paper coming out about it, and it's rapidly going to become a thing. We'll share with the Smash team before anybody else. Smashamash.com slash Smash team. So looking at solar flare probability, this likelihood of large flares is still very high, and it's because of sunspot 2860. It is a beta gamma class sunspot, and this area here is now a sunspot as well. Perhaps you heard it here first. We don't miss a trick when it comes to these sorts of things. KP index a measurement of global geomagnetism only at 1. 
And each one of those green bars represents three hours. And check it out. We saw a C-class flare here while I did show prep. And then we saw a dip, a major dip, in the long wave radiation from both the GOES-16 and the GOES-17. So you see these dips here, sudden dips there in the long wave portion of the X-ray frequency. Once again, likelihood of major flares, and I'm talking about flares way up here, likelihood of that is greater than 50% in my opinion, and the computer simulations agree. Here's the proton flux over the past three days, no spikes in that. That's typically caused by relativistic particles from coronal mass ejections, especially ones fueled by solar flares. And we'll go to the real-time solar wind next, which has been fairly uneventful. By the way, there was a weak coronal mass ejection strike around midday yesterday. So you see this signal right here. You can see a, a dip in the plasma temperature. That's this green line. You can see uh, a dip in the solar wind speed because the coronal mass ejection was slow. And you can see uh, a shift in the phi angle all at the same time. Some minor perturbations here in the density also. But mainly that is a very weak that's what happens when a coronal mass ejection almost entirely misses. And it looks like we may actually be seeing some more turbulence kicking up right now. So that could be the cause of the GOES-16 and 17's magnetometer disparities. It looks like there is something going on here as we see this signal right here in the plasma temperature once again. And a bit of variation in the solar wind speed. Keep in mind when the speeds are so slow, it's easy for a signal to hide. Not as easy as when the solar wind speed is very fast and dense. Anyway, here's the geospace as modeled by the space weather modeling framework over the past four hours. The last four hours of space weather modeling framework. Magnetohydrodynamic pressure modeled in nanopascals. Fairly homogeneous here. I'm expecting a tiny little down tick here at the last little bit, and you can indeed see a tiny reduction in pressure there. Next, we'll look at the Earth's B field and changes in it. Geospace Delta B. Ground magnetic perturbations, our other geospace magnetosphere movie like the last one. It's four hours of data. This is modeled in nanotesla, not nanopascals. And you can see evidence of the polar excursion going on the south geomagnetic pole someplace down here. I'm going to let that play through a second time. We did see some pulses out of the eastern portion of the world there. Looked like around places like Indonesia, the Philippines. And since it refreshed, we're going to advance this. We don't want this section to be overly long. And here come some pulses out of the eastern portion of the world. Yep, some pulses coming out of the Papua New Guinea region. Very minor, though. Here's a diagram of the solar system. We like our viewers to have good astrography and know where things are located. So here's where they're located in the solar system. We'll advance it one week. There's where things will be on September 8th, eight days into Smash Timber. Make sure you make it a Smash Timber to OMASH member by visiting our links. Here's what's going on above my head right now. I'm located in Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. And we are showing here the galactic plane, as well as the ecliptic plane, which is the yellow line. The galactic plane is the blue line. The moon is near the apex of its flight. Jupiter has just set where we're located. If you want to make yourself a star chart, head to in-the-sky.org. We've got a small integrated cosmology segment, and we plan to do another one later today. As we've got, I've got about 17 tabs on my phone open to share with you. Today's random number is 183, but we didn't pick that at all. We picked 184 which is the crab pulsar. Here's a quick blurb about the crab pulsar. It emits x-rays. It's one of the most consistent x-ray sources visible from Earth. And there you can see how consistent indeed it is over the past about 16 years. Here's the 30-day chart of it. And here's a quick view of the crab, otherwise known as M1, a supernova remnant which has a pulsar in the middle of it. And here's some additional imagery, by the way. This is the gamma ray spectra. And you can see the galactic plane there. Uh, only one gamma ray source brighter than crab. 
which is, I believe that's Gaminga, the Gaminga Pulsar. So anyway, there is the Crab Pulsar in Gamma. Let's take a look at it in X-ray. There's a false color X-ray survey of it. Not the best imagery there. Let's take a look at it in UV. And there you can see a great plasma signature there, the UV emissions from the Crab Pulsar. And let's keep going down the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. Let's go into the optical spectrum here. How about some imagery from pan stars? And there's a great view of the nebular cloud, the quote, supernoval and quote, remnant, the nebular cloud surrounding the crab pulsar. Last but not least, we'll take a look at it on the two mass, the infrared survey. And there is the crab pulsar in infrared light. The thermal emissions from M1, the crab pulsar, today's featured object. And check out the astronomy picture of the day today. You can find it yourself at apod.nasa.gov. It's crazy radio jets from two galaxies. So this galaxy up here. appears to be emitting two jets here. One of them appears to be interacting with this galaxy down here, but I'm not entirely sure. This one may be obscured by this other jet, which could be in the foreground. But you can see a great example of the polar fields of these galaxies emitting jets. So there's one polar field jet. There's the other polar field jet. Here's the other galaxy's polar field jet. And you can see the way they're offset a bit. This is a normal thing that we see. In fact, the Milky Way galaxies uh, jets associated with the galactic core are offset at an even greater angle than this. And I won't cover it in today's cosmology segment as it's integrated into the daily space weather video. But great imagery here at apod.nasa.gov. And these are, I'm not sure what galaxies they are. I'm not going to really worry about it. Check it out yourself. That's today's cosmology segment. It was integrated into the daily space weather. Check our playlists for hundreds more videos about cosmology. Let's talk about electrons. They can charge satellites, but they aren't currently doing so. Here's a one-year chart of the relativistic electrons surrounding planet Earth, reported from Solent.info. And here is the three-day chart. And we got into warning levels once again yesterday. And we've just crept into warning levels once again today. So we've now gone over 1,000 pulse flux units or in this case, it's actually showing you the particle density, which is a slightly different measurement here, but it coincides with the same amount of electrons. It's electron density on this scale here. Red line is a go 17. Blue line is a go 16. And here's the forecast. I think we were right on on this forecast yesterday. I don't really remember. Watch yesterday's Daily Space Weather video if you want to see what our electron forecast was. But in any case, the blue, uh, the green boxes are the uh, forecast and the yellow diamonds are the observation. Here's a diagram of Earth Van Allen belts we show it daily to quantify what it is we're looking at. By the way, the electrons are bouncing back and forth here at nearly light speed, as electrons are wont to do. Here's a total electron content forecast. And it gives us insight into where we're likely to see GPS errors. The most likely location of that is around the equator at noon. And as we approach another equinox, we can expect to see more geo-effective stuff going on. This is showing you the electron density for the entire air column up to a geosynchronous satellite, which is at an altitude of tens of thousands of miles of altitude. So giving you a good indication of how many electrons are there and where they're located. Here's another diagram showing you where the F ionosphere is located at about 300 kilometers of altitude. It also shows you electromagnetic penetration and temperatures of the thermosphere at solar min and solar max. So here's the ionosphere. And we are seeing some anomalies here. They're minor. Some southern hemisphere low frequency anomalies. Anyway, rather than try to explain this, what it's showing you here is vibrational frequency in megahertz, millions of vibrations per second. And we'll just show you the anomaly 
animation as well. So here's the latest image that's from 9.30 Universal Time today on the first day of Smash Timber, September 1st. And here is the anomaly map. And when we say anomaly, we're talking about anomaly in megahertz from the 30-day median. So we saw a significant low-frequency anomaly there move across Hawaii. So that's one thing to note. Right here, you're going to see a low-frequency anomaly right there. Also some high-frequency anomalies there shown in blue. Nothing to write home about. Like I said, they're pretty minor. And here's the latest image. That's from 9.30 Universal Time. And there's the megahertz. A little bit of a low-frequency anomaly here in the Northern Hemisphere at the moment. And there is the anomaly chart. All right, and we just did another meteorology segment. Make sure you check that out. If you didn't, it aired before the Daily Space Weather video. Here's your bonus features in the form of Sunspot 2860 remaining very likely to produce major flares. Here's the newest sunspot. It looks like it's degraded a little bit since we did show prep. So I pressed refresh, and the umbra shrunk. So this one's a little bit indecisive. This one is not indecisive at all. 2860 likely to produce major flares still as it is about to set in the southwestern limb. There's that possible new group. Again, there it is. You can see a tiny umbra. It's currently alpha class. It's a little indecisive. Here's the latest from El Taide, Spain, the ground-based solar observatory. Likelihood of coronal mass ejections down a little bit here. There is a filament over here. Filament up here could actually end up all the way at Earth also. You never know as these things eject in a rather chaotic fashion. But in any case, there's the latest imagery from El Taide, Spain, only three and a half minutes old from when we recorded the video. And we get these uploaded quickly. We don't edit them so that we can get them onto your screens promptly. So here's the filament we were just looking at in the northwest. A great animation here from the SDO. All right, I may have missed the imagery there. I apologize if I failed to show it. There's 2860. There's the possible new sunspot group. There's the magnetogram of the new sunspot group, and there's the magnetogram of sunspot 2860. Here's the El Taide data. So there are some filaments. Coronal mass ejection watch remains in effect. Solar flare warning remains in effect. Here's this filament in the northwest. Fairly spectacular there, an ionized helium. Here's the new rising group in the northeast. And we'll close things out with the extremely photogenic Sunspot 2860. Here it is in ionized helium. Just a great sunspot here. It's been pretty interesting, and I think it's going to produce an M-class flare before it sets. And here it is in my favorite wavelength, 171 angstroms. Just spectacular, and it's going to be a spectacular month. So again, visit our links, support the channel. Thanks everybody who tuned in. And may that solar wind be at your back.